All right, today on the bench, we've got a 73 twin reverb. That's a silver face with a master volume. Someone cut the power cord off. There's some tube issues, pot issues, the speakers are blown, and the grid resistors have some tolerance issues. I'm most worried about that power cord, though. Usually when I see that, that means something very bad has happened. Uh, here we're just removing the cover for the filter caps. Those are are not what came with that amp. So someone has worked on it, replaced those. The work looks pretty good. Uh, let's go ahead and test those tubes. We have mismatched power tubes and only two of them. We're supposed to have four. I don't know what brand that is. Never really heard of it. Uh, I'm fairly young though, so you know maybe they're better than I think they are. That groove tube tests good. This uh, brand here, National Electric or something like that, is going to test fine. We've only got five of the f six preamp tubes, and two of them are AT7s, four of them are supposed to be AX7s. So I've marked on the chassis where some things were missing, where the AT7 I pulled was, uh, you know, and, and what all that means. This tube here, though, uh, was in a position where a 12AX7 is supposed to be, when I test it on my tube tester, it is pegging my meter out uh, to the good side. And you would think that that is a good sign. It's actually not. That's not supposed to happen. So it turns out this is actually a 12AT7 that someone had put where a 12AX7 goes. And it probably came out of that tube socket where there was not a tube. Uh, you know, I don't know why somebody did that. I, yeah, I, I can't really explain that. But uh, the rest of these tubes are going to test fine on the tester. There's a possibility once we uh, put some audio through the amp, which we haven't done yet, that they might be microphonic or, you know, have some sort of other issue going on with them. But for now, everything is looking pretty good. So let's get this amp, check the fuse on it. Um, it's not blown, okay, we checked it for continuity. It's a 4 amp fast blow, supposed to be a 3 amp slow blow. That's close enough, that's fine for an old vintage fender there. That RCA connector that's sticking out is just being used to make sure the trim low is on all the time rather than using a foot switch. You just control it with the pot for the, uh, the intensity. Um, there I'm checking continuity for the pilot light. It uh, appears to be good on our meter. So let's go ahead, oh, look at that. Those are Illinois caps right there I just pointed at. So that tells us that this amp has definitely been worked on. Uh, it would have not had uh, Illinois caps in it at the time. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to replace that power cord, though. Um, typically, any sort of uh, generic, like a Hosa IEC cable is usually a great size to, uh, to replace on a Fender amp. But in this case, I have plenty of power cords lying around from God knows what. Um, so I'm just going to grab one I've got that is the right gauge, put the old cable stay on it, give it a little squeeze of my channel lock so that it makes an uh, impression in the vinyl there on the uh, outside of that cable so we can get it into the chassis. Here I'm going to make a dumb mistake. I'm going to cut the end off of the ground wire because I am planning on soldering it to the chassis. That is a terrible idea. Anytime you have to solder to a fender chassis, uh, you're going to have a bad time and you usually need two soldering irons. I have two soldering irons. I don't want to use two soldering irons. So here I am reversing the mistake I made, putting a new end on it. I'm going to crimp it here. And uh, now I'm going to solder that wire to that connector, okay? Uh, that is done because we need connections to be strong physically as well as electrically. All right, so the crimp is physical, the solder is electrical killer. We're going to uh, now attach that ground wire uh, to where the old one was, all right? So it's a couple of nuts there, pull them off, put the new ground wire on, put it, those nuts back on. So it's the old school trick being used there of uh, using two nuts so they don't back off when, you know, instances where you just use one nut, you know, uh, it might vibrate loose. I mean, a twin reverb is very loud, and uh, those 12-inch speakers can be pretty bassy. So here we're going to replace the black wire uh, there. I'm doing them one at a time so that I don't make any dumb mistakes in case I get interrupted by a phone call or something. 
uh, like that, you know, it's many times you're in the middle of doing something and somebody calls and says, hey, I've got an amp and it's making a weird noise and, you know, it's blah, blah, blah. And you start thinking, oh, man, what? What was I doing? So that's why I do them one at a time. I know it's probably a little bit slower. I should probably also instinctively know where things are supposed to go. But if you do it this way, it is much, much, much harder to make a dumb mistake. And I've already made one, as you saw with that ground wire. So it took me a minute to get that black wire attached. I wound up having to uh, put some fresh solder on the connection, remove the old wire, then use my solder pole, which I'm a huge fan of. It's my solder sucker there, um, to remove some solder. So, and then just just enough um, that I was able to get the new wire on. So there's actually a couple of wires on each of these uh, connections there. That's on the vanity outlet. Um, so that's you know why there's a bit of a a finagling art to it. So once I'd got the black wire though, the white wire went much much easier. So thank God for experience. Um, so we've got that thing connected. Now what we've got to do is plug it up and see if that tranny's good. So here I'm going through my light bulb. Ah, okay. Light bulb indicates no issues. Pilot light is on. A little bit of damage to it. There's some damage to that chassis there. Chassis bolts are a little bent. Uh, I noticed earlier. So at some point somebody bumped it. That's really all that happened. Uh, so I'm putting a quad of groove tubes in it. I don't have any. I thought I had some some like cheaper tubes I could try in case something goes awry. But all I've got is some nice groove tubes. So let's tube it up, man. We're going to do it. Uh, we know the tra the uh, power train is good. So let's see what happens through that light bulb when we put power tubes in it. So uh, the light bulb is a great visual indicator. Oh, also, don't reach over top of the filter caps like I did. Put a cover on it like I'm doing now. Uh, learn from my mistakes. Okay, that's about what we'd expect. The amp is now on. Okay, with those power tubes in it. Um, that light bulb is a... Uh, that light bulb is about where it should be. Okay. Uh, in a second, you're going to see it turn. Yep. Okay, that's what we should expect there, going from standby to on, and now uh, off. All right, so I tested the amp, put some audio through it. Quite a few of the pots are pretty dirty. So I'm using some Deoxit D5, trying to clean them up and uh, and make sure that that they're in pristine condition. I'd rather not replace them if I don't have to. That's time consuming and, you know, also costs money for the pot. I'll use that Deoxit D5 also to clean the switches as well as the uh, input jacks. And then I'll also take, as you can see here, a contact burnisher to clean the contacts there on those jacks. If those are dirty, you can actually knock your audio out. So I've seen amps come in, guys think something's super wrong with them. And uh, in the end, uh, it was just those contacts. It's a shame, usually when people bring things in and think nothing is wrong with their amplifier, tons of things are wrong. I, I wish uh, it weren't the reverse weren't also true. Um, yeah, so now I'm just looking for any kind of wires that might be trying to snap, any kind of trash. That's pretty mild compared to things you can find in an amplifier. I want to make sure there's no... Problem areas, no ticking time bombs, uh, nothing that's conducting where it shouldn't, nothing that uh, should be conducting and is not, that kind of thing. Um, with an amp this old, chances are something is going to have to be resoldered, something has become brittle, etc. The tech that worked on this before did a pretty good job. Um, they did nick a wire or two, so we're gonna we're gonna address that here in a minute. Um, the wire's not exposed, which is probably why they left it, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't like to do that. That's just a recipe for later disaster. Um, here's a pretty good example of what I'm talking about, about like a ticking time bomb. Is this wire here? It was hanging on by just like a couple of strands. So that is a problem. A twin reverb vibrates enough that that could 
uh, in the middle of a gig break, and then somebody, especially somebody who makes their living playing, you know, if they're backupless for some reason, it's over. So there was a shot of that wire that we're going to put a little electrical tape on. I just don't like leaving something there that the iron has uh, has hit. Um, here I'm resoldering. I'm, I'm well cutting back and uh, tinning and then resoldering that wire that snapped, and then we'll address that uh, wire that needs a little electrical tape. Uh, part of doing work on a vintage amp like this or any amp is making sure that you don't uh, do something that is cosmetically an issue, right? So don't nickel wire with your soldering iron. doesn't matter that uh, you don't get all the way through the insulation. Uh, it's about the fact that, that you want to do quality work, uh, even aesthetically. So here I'm going to check those grid resistors on the power tubes. They're supposed to measure about 470 ohms. Now they're carbon resistors. They've been in there since 1973. So they're going to drift and drift up, but 510 ohms, give or take, is, uh, is pretty concerning. Um, the other ones are going to measure about 480 ohms. That's not a problem, except for the fact that one of them measures 510 ohms. So I didn't have anything that was close to 480 in a 1 watt size in my parts drawer. So... I just went ahead and replaced all four grid resistors. Unfortunately, I didn't film it, but um, replaced all four with some one waters, 470 ohms. So they're back to factory spec on that. Uh, next, I'm going to check those screen resistors on the power tube. So there's, there's two resistors on each power tube socket. Uh, one measures 470 ohms. We've just read those. Uh, the others should read about 1.5K. Again, they're carbon resistors. They've been there a long time. But uh, as long as they're close to 1.5K and close to each other, that doesn't really present a problem. So you can see there's a little bit of drift there. You know, typically if you pull a 1.5K resistor out of a drawer that's brand new, it's going to read a little bit shy of 1.5K. These are all uh, reading a little north of it. Um, and next, I'm going to read every, uh, or pretty much every resistor in this amplifier. There's not that many. Uh, and that's the case for most vintage amplifiers. Uh, they're carbon, they drift. I've said this like four times. It's important to go through, make sure they're all pretty close to what they should be. Some of these resistors are incredibly important to the tone of the amplifier, some not so much. But, uh, but there are some that you know, if the amplifier has sort of lost all of its life, uh, you can check those. They'll typically be out of tolerance, and then you can replace them. Luckily, all these are intolerance, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, some of them I was reading through a cap. I actually went back later and pulled the cap out of circuit so I could read the resistors. Okay, so I tested the amp after that. It turns out a couple of pots just I could not get them clean. One was the reverb pot. So I actually haven't hooked the reverb tank up to the chassis yet. So you may say, well, how do I know uh, that the reverb pot needed to be replaced? Well, uh, typically when you don't have a load on something um, like this, this reverb pot, you know, there's nowhere for it to go. Um, I, I don't like to crank it up. Um, but in this case, you know, you can quickly go full deflection and, and go back. Um, and I heard there was a problem spot that I just could not get clean. I sprayed it with dioxin a couple of times. Same deal with one of the tone controls uh, to my left. You can see the knobs off. I'm going to replace that guy as well. I like to make a little diagram on my bench. Uh, my bench is, uh, well, to call it a bench is, is, you know, probably idealistic and kind. But it's, it's what the work surface I've got right now. Um... For all its faults, uh, it is white and I can write on it. So I like to make little diagrams and refer back to them. Again, you might say, why would you do that? I mean, it's on the reverb pot, three wires. On the tone control, it's two. How could And they're dressed, right? So you should be able to tell where they go. I just don't want to make any mistakes that I have to go back and fix later. I, I, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot. A lot of, uh, of sort of hobbyist texts that I have coming behind over the years, I have found that they just tend to sort of shoot themselves in the foot. Um, if they, you know, if they're pretty competent in troubleshooting, they're, the 
you know, issues become uh, something physical, like putting a wire back in the wrong place. Uh, now, if they can't troubleshoot, I mean, there's there's no saving them. But um, all right, so here I am just knocking out that that tone pot. Uh, next thing we're gonna do is is test this amp again. Everything has been through my light bulb limiter with a 16 ohm load on it. Uh, typical ohm load on a, a twin reverb should be four ohms. <laughs> I think here we're going to find why someone decided to cut the power cord off, maybe. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm testing the uh, speaker uh, resistance. So those are two 8-ohm speakers in parallel uh, measuring the tip and the sleeve of the uh, plug. Uh, it's out of frame. You can't see it. But uh, measuring that, I should get 4 ohms. I'm not. I got a, a pretty high resistance. Here you can see it again on an individual speaker. Yeah. So there's uh, electricity takes the path of least resistance. It's not possible that that speaker would be good and for me to get that sort of reading. That's incredibly high. All right. Here's the reverb tank. Let's see. Typically you should have, uh, yeah, about, let's see, what is it going to, yeah, 180, about 180 ohms on one side. The other side should read pretty low, uh, you know, sub 10 ohms. Yeah, okay, sure. What, four ohms or something? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that tank is probably in good shape. Uh, I tested the continuity of the cables later. They were good. So here we're going to test everything. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to just testing it under full power with a, you know, four ohm load. <laughs> Thank you. 
count two pots four resistors two brand new jensen's a quad of brand new groove tubes and a brand new jj preamp tube wound up sounding pretty good i think that's a 73 twin reverb silver face master volume on that thing uh, this has been a little video from commonwealth pro audio thanks for watching bye bye